This past week, our nation has been battered by Storm Eunice. England and Wales especially. Uh, and we've had all kinds of alerts from the Met Office, the Environmental Agency, the police, and anybody else who's got anything to do with our safety. Lots of alerts, lots of warnings. And at one point, you know, this week, it didn't affect us here directly in Derbyshire, but down in London, the southeast, the southwest, and Wales, there was a red alert. And that's unusual. But a red alert means life and limb is in danger. And sadly, at least three people have died as a consequence of this storm. And a number of other people across the continent, as the storm has spread over there, have also lost their lives. Such a warning is justified, given the circumstances. Think of all the damage that has been done and the threat to human life. There was even a record of a gust of wind over 120 miles an hour off the Isle of Wight, off the Needles. That's how vicious this storm was. That's how dangerous it was. Now, Ezekiel would have understood about alerts and warnings. And what you have here, in one sense, is God's red alert, if I may put it that way. Ezekiel was speaking, of course, on a different level, but he was speaking about the danger to life and limb and its eternal consequences. He was prophesying in the days before Nebuchadnezzar came and totally destroyed the city of Jerusalem, dismantled the temple, and took off hundreds of people to captivity. Here was a red alert then from God, from the prophet Ezekiel, far more serious than storms and the threat of high winds and flooding. Here was the priest turned prophet, and he was given a very specific role to play by God. I want us first of all then to consider his role as a watchman. That is how he is clearly identified here and in Ezekiel chapter 33. Look at the text there in verses 16 and 17. It is God who is speaking. It came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. It is the Lord, first of all, who appoints Ezekiel. He doesn't think, oh, I'll take on the role of a watchman, given the situation that I'm in. God says, no, I'm going to make you a watchman. That's going to be what you actually do. Now, in Ezekiel's day, every city had a wall around it. It would have had a watchtower and ramparts, and the watchman would have patrolled on the ramparts and on the on the the watchtower. His job, as we saw in Ezekiel 33, was to watch out for the enemy. And if he saw the enemy advance, then he was to blow a blast on the trumpet and everybody would realize danger. And it was his job, as it were, to sound the trumpet. But the Lord appoints him. We also see further. The same Lord appoints him to give a warning. Notice how it is put in this verse 17. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them a warning from me. This, is, this message doesn't originate then with Ezekiel. He's appointed by God as the watchman and he is given a specific task to bring a warning, a warning from heaven itself. Now, that means that the Lord God has something 
vital to say to this people. They're in danger. They are in grave danger. Their lives are at stake. They are not aware, but God is aware, and he does not turn a blind eye to this situation. He is concerned for his glory, but he's also concerned for their good. That's why he's giving a warning. It's for their good. It's for their safety, if they will only listen to what he has to say. But then you see, not only is he appointed by the Lord, he's given a message from the Lord and this warning. He has a huge responsibility entrusted to him. There are very, very few people here who are old enough, you'd have to be a bit older than me, to remember World War II and those air raid sirens. You may have heard them. They've been dubbed onto lots of films. If you stood within 20 or 30 yards of one of those, you'd be in pain. It was a fearful noise. But at the beginning of the war, adverts went up, wanted responsible men for a responsible job. They were to be the air raid wardens. And when the enemy aircraft were approaching, they would have to press the button to set the siren off, and some of them, they were hand ones, and you had to, like starting an old car, to start the whole thing up. But it was a fearful noise, but it was an alert, it was a warning. Danger, danger. And you see, this is what is happening here. But it's on a different scale altogether, because God is speaking to his people, and his people are in a state they don't recognize and don't realize and he is appointed to make this sound of warning. And if he doesn't act responsibly, if he doesn't sound the warning note, then he is going to be responsible for the lives of those people. God will require their blood at his hand. He has an awesome responsibility to speak a word of warning from God to these people. If that person to whom he's speaking, or the people to whom he's speaking, if they pay no heed to the warning, then they are going to be responsible. They will be accountable. But Ezekiel will be free from that responsibility, and he will, God will not require their blood at his hand. You have delivered your soul, he says in verse 19. You see, Ezekiel is answerable to God. He is accountable to God. Ezekiel is but an instrument in the hands of God, but he is a watchman who is to deliver this warning. And before we move on, let me say that Ezekiel then is a very apt picture of a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of the gospel is, involves warning people about sin, as we will see in some detail in a moment. When a, a preacher begins to speak about sin and its consequences and identifies it and begins to, the Word of God begins to point a finger at your heart and your conscience, then people get very uncomfortable. Over the years, people have said to me, Oh, I'm not coming to your services. All you do is make me feel guilty. Well, that's part of the purpose of the preaching of the Word of God. It's to show us our sin and our guilt. And sometimes even Christians object to hearing words about judgment and warning. But sin, you see, is always dangerous. Always dangerous. Even to a Christian. Sometimes we, we may think, well, I'm a Christian now. I'm justified by faith. I, I don't need to think too much about sin. But let me ask you this. Has sin changed its character? Has becoming a Christian mean that sin has changed its character? Your relationship has changed, 
There's no question about that. A Christian is someone who's been forgiven, no longer guilty in the eyes of God. You are justified. But you can't then play soft pedal with sin. You can't minimize and say, oh, it'll have no effect on me and shrug your shoulders and go on. This passage speaks to that as we will see in a moment. We've seen how the Apostle Paul was urging Timothy. David has taken us through that, that fourth chapter in 2 Timothy. And you remember there, the same accountability, the same responsibility is laid upon Timothy by Paul. I charge you, therefore, verse 1, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. That's, that's, the, that's the backdrop. It's a message of warning. It's a message of judgment because this God will judge the living and the dead. It is appearing. Therefore, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. There are those people who have got itching ears. They don't want to listen to this gospel message. They don't want to listen to these warnings. But you, he says, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And that's what God is saying through Ezekiel to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry as a watchman. And that is the responsibility of every gospel preacher. The same apostle, Paul, you remember he said when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said there that we are a fragrance of Christ to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. We're an aroma of death unto death to those who are perishing and an aroma of life unto life to those who are being saved. You see, you cannot escape this. What would you think of me or someone else in this congregation if I was walking past your house late one night after you've gone to bed, what are we doing out there? I don't know, but it's an illustration. <laughs> Supposing I was walking past your house. The lights were out. You'd all gone to bed. And as I walked past your house, I smelt smoke. And I could see flames in the living room and in the kitchen. I just walk on. Ignore you. Leave you. What would you think of me? You'd say, what a pathetic individual, wouldn't you? You would rightly condemn me. Rightly condemn me for not issuing a warning and shouting out, fire, fire, knocking on your door, hammering, calling the police, calling the fire brigade, just doing nothing. Let me ask you then, have you realized the role, the true role of a gospel preacher he is one who must give an account to Jesus Christ for the way in which he has preached the gospel. If he does not give a clear warning, sound, then that person is not really concerned for your welfare, for your good. And he will be accountable to God You see, a watchman is not only bringing a warning about judgment, but he is a minister of mercy. This warning displays the mercy of God. Ezekiel is a mouthpiece of divine mercy to this nation of Israel. And so is a preacher of the gospel when he preaches about sin. Because until you realize the nature of sin, you won't come to Christ. You won't turn to Christ. Now let's look at this message more specifically. Secondly, and consider God's warnings. 
the consequences of sin and of not turning away from your sins. Repentance. If you don't repent, if you don't turn from your sin to God, what are the consequences? That's the burden of Ezekiel's message. That's why he was appointed, first of all, as a watchman. These men and women and children that he was speaking to were exiles. They'd been carried away in the first attack by Nebuchadnezzar. The city had not yet been destroyed, but they were the first people taken away. They traveled, they had to walk five or six hundred miles from Jerusalem and Judah across the deserts to Babylon. Few, if any of them, had any idea as to why they were taken away into exile. They turned a deaf ear to all the prophets who'd spoken before. You remember Jeremiah was there, and no one listened to Jeremiah. They weren't interested in him and what he had to say. And Ezekiel is called to preach to these people and to tell them why they were in exile. Their sinful pattern of life. They'd forsaken God. They turned to idols. They turned to the immorality that was associated with idol worship. They'd cast God's word behind their back. They'd blocked their ears. They'd shut out God's voice. And Ezekiel is called to proclaim to them There's a reason for the soul. There's a reason for the famine. There's a reason for pestilence. I think there would have been some of these exiles who would have thought within a very short time they'd be taken back to Jerusalem and restored to their land. They had no real idea about what was happening. And because of their unbelief and because of their ignorance and because of their hard hearts they were living a lie they were deluded and God identifies their condition as wickedness notice in verse 18 when I say to the wicked now wicked isn't a very popular word today there's a slang version of course of wicked It means cool. Well, it's nothing to do with that. Wickedness is moral evil. Wickedness is something which is against God. Wickedness is morally bad. We are sinners by nature. We are wicked by nature. We have sinful hearts and we have sinful habits. And Ezekiel is called to preach to them. God is holy and righteous. Ezekiel has seen God in his glory. And he's been overwhelmed by that. And now he comes. And he comes back to these captives, these exiles. And we read in the previous verse, verse 15, he sat down with them and remained there astonished among them seven days. This is an indication of how much grief and sorrow filled the heart of this man. He had seen God in his glory, and then he looks upon this nation in its wickedness. And he mourns, he grieves. Job's three friends, you remember them, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, before they said anything to Job, they sat there for seven days and mourned over his condition and state. Ezekiel is doing exactly the same thing. But then verses 16 and 17, you have this red warning from God. The consequences of sin. Verse 18, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning or speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. 
You say to the wicked, God says to the wicked, it's not Ezekiel's message, it's God saying, you shall surely die because of your sin. And this word is spoken not only to the wicked, but it is also spoken in verse 20 to the righteous man. Now, that's a bit of a puzzle. What, what is, who is he referring to here? Is this a man who is simply outwardly righteous? Is this someone who's backslidden? I, I'm not sure I can give you a definite answer. But the point is that if this man who is described as a righteous man, if he reaches the point where he goes on in sin and does nothing about it, he's no better off than the wicked man. What Ezekiel is driving at here is the seriousness of sin and its consequences. Whether it's a wicked man, an openly wicked man, or someone who appears to be righteous, you cannot ever ignore sin. I must underline that. It does not change its character. So how serious is sin? God says, you will surely die. You will surely die. Sin and death cannot be divorced. One follows on the other. The wages of sin, says Paul, is death. Yet for most people today, and probably in Ezekiel's day too, people regard death as a natural biological process. You live for so long, then one or more of your organs begins to fail and not work properly. And then another organ fails to work properly, and eventually your heart stops. The blood stops going around your body, and you die. The cells die. They begin to decompose. If your body is laid into the ground, it rots away. Sometimes people cremate. It just speeds up the process. It returns to ashes. And then they say, you cease to exist. That's the modern view of death. It's no wonder people don't want to talk about it. It's such a bleak picture. You live so many years, you die, you're snuffed out, you're finished. That's it. That's not the Bible's view of sin and death. You see, if you have an eye, a right idea of sin, then you begin to see that death is the result of sin. In fact, it is a punishment for sin. It's God's punishment for our sin. Where have you heard those words before? You shall surely die. Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. God says to Adam, Adam, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. If you do, you will surely die. It's an interesting little Hebrew idiom. It means, in literally, dying you will die. That's a way, of, a Hebrew way of saying, this is certain, absolutely certain. If you disobey, you will die. If you sin against me, Adam, you will die. And here is God saying the same thing to this generation. You sin, you go on in your sin, dying you will die. Remember what the, 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 the serpent said, the devil said, what Satan said. He's the father of lies. Has God said, you won't surely die? And people have swallowed that lie. They did it in Ezekiel's day, and they do it today. Adam disobeyed God. 
and Adam died. Now, he didn't die physically immediately, but he died in terms of his relationship to God, didn't he? He and Eve, what what did they do? After they disobeyed God, they heard God walking in the garden. Run away, hide. They hid away from God. There was no longer that life, that fellowship between God and Adam and Eve. It was destroyed by sin. And then Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden with those words ringing in their ears, dust you are and to dust you shall return. And Adam died. And you have that chapter 5 in Genesis. So and so lived so many years and he died. So and so lived so many years and he died. Death entered the world when Adam sinned. Through one man, Paul says, sin entered the world and death through sin. So how serious is sin? How serious is sin? What is God pressing home upon their conscience and our consciences? If you are paying attention to God's word, sin is wickedness against God and it will bring inevitable, eternal Punishment. Not just punishment here, but eternal punishment. Sin, when it's fully grown, says James, results in death. And the writer to the Hebrew says that after death, what? The judgment. The judgment of God. God will judge the living and the dead. There'll be no one who can escape that day. That's why Paul will write to Timothy. This God will judge, Christ will judge on that day when he appears. And if you die in your sins, think about this. If you die in your sins and you've not turned to God in repentance and not turned to Jesus Christ in faith and laid hold upon him, then your sin will be the reason why you face everlasting destruction in hell. I tremble to say those things. But if I don't say those things, your blood will be on my head. I will be responsible. I stand here tonight as one who is seeking to bring The truth home. Dying, you will die unless you are found in Christ. You will die in the guilt of your sin. You will die in bondage to sin. You will die under the wrath of God and under the curse of God. That is a bleak picture. But it's what we must preach. You and I have a bad record, a wicked record. We have bad hearts, wicked hearts. We've all sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. When God says, dying you will die, which one of us will stand before God? and deny that and call God's word into question. Rather, our hands should be over our mouths and we should be laid in the dust. The whole world is guilty before God. There isn't one person who is righteous, who does not deserve the wrath and condemnation of God. Is that all Ezekiel then has to say? Is it all the gospel preacher has to say? No. Even a warning, and I come back now to this which we've already mentioned, even a warning is evidence of God's mercy and kindness. But even more than that, 
There is more than mercy and there is more than just kindness here. Consider then thirdly with me and lastly, God's assurance that if you turn from your sin, you will live. Repentance is repentance unto life. Life everlasting. But you must turn from your sin. And God's assurance is given to us here. Let me say at this point that if you, if you have any understanding of God's holiness, any understanding of your own sinfulness, then you stand amazed tonight that you've not been judged and cast away from the presence of God forever. Why hasn't God done that? It's what I deserve. It's what you deserve. It's what every man, woman, and child in this room deserves. But God hasn't done that. We know that every sin deserves the wrath and judgment of God. But our text talks about those who will heed the warning God gives. Verse 18 talks about saving his life. If he heeds what Ezekiel is saying, and he heeds the warning, he will save his life. He turns from his sin. He will save his life. It becomes very explicit in verse 21. If you warn the righteous man, the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin. Interesting. He shall surely live. Here's the other side of it. Living, he will live. Sin, dying, you will die. But here is the man who repents. Repentance is unto life. Living, he will live. What is God saying? What is God saying through Ezekiel? What is God saying to us? He's saying to you, he's saying to me, heed my warning and repent of your sins. Turn from your sins. Turn from the love of sin. Turn from the practice of sin and live. And live. Realize that your sin is something against God and turn from it with purpose of mind and heart to live a new life of obedience. This is the only way of escape. But it is God who is saying, I am being merciful. I've opened that way of escape. I am warning you ahead of time. I'm patient. I'm kind. I'm not swift to show my anger. If you will only listen to what I am saying, I'm warning you in order that you might see that I am a merciful and a kind God who will grant you repentance unto life. This warning is intended to open the door to mercy and forgiveness. It paves the way for what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 33. These are some of the most amazing words in Scripture. To anyone who understands, I am a sinner who deserves the wrath and judgment of God. Verse 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God. Isn't this amazing? This is the God who said, Dying you will die. But he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from their sin and live. And then God pleads. He pleads with this people. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? What mercy, what kindness. God is willing to receive returning sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ was exactly the same. He wept over Jerusalem of his day. Why? Because they were about to be destroyed. They didn't know it. And he grieved over them. Oh, that you would know the things that make for your peace. It was totally lost on them. 
And again, later on, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often, how often, it's a repeated thing, how often would I have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks when those chicks are in danger? And then what is his cry? But you would not. What grief was in his heart. You would not come. He was willing to receive them. He was showing mercy and kindness to them. Feel the groans of Christ in this cry from the depths of his heart. See your house has been left to you desolate. You see, here is the mercy of Christ. We could demonstrate it again from Paul and other texts of Scripture. There is mercy. See, so you, you're not going to come to Jesus Christ. You're going to come back to God unless there is mercy. If I stand here and just wave my fist and say, damnation, damnation, damnation for you, they'll give you the threat of warning. But I don't tell you there is mercy. You'll never come. Why would you come to a God who's going to destroy you? But here is a God who holds out his arms in kindness, in mercy. It's a warning, yes, but it's a merciful warning that is intended to save you from eternal destruction. Why would God do that? Because he is mercy. Because he is made up of mercy. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. So I ask you, Jerusalem did not know, in Jesus' day did not know, they did not understand what made for their peace. Do you know what makes for your peace with God? It's a crucified Christ. Christ shedding his blood on the cross to atone for your sins. It's Christ bearing your sin, bearing the wrath that you deserve. I can't explain that. I can only declare it. I know it is true. Because I know that God has forgiven me through Jesus Christ. And there are many of you sitting here who will say the same thing. You found that God is merciful. But I'm saying to anybody here this evening who is not yet a Christian, I'm telling you about the mercy of God, the mercy of Christ, his willingness to save sinners. Why did he come into this world? To seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost. And without Christ, you don't have a leg to stand on. And you will be exposed on the judgment day. But I'm telling you that so it will alarm you and make you realize, I must then go to Christ. And if you go to Christ, there you will find mercy. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. To whom was he speaking? Those words in John 6. If you read it in its context, it's to a group of people who were sinners and who were saying, we want a sign. They were wicked in asking for a sign. The evidence was there before them in the person of Christ and the words that he spoke. No, we want a sign. We want to see that you are the Messiah. The ministry of Christ must be one of the most painful things apart from the cross that he endured. Because people that he spoke to again and again did not heed what he said to their own cost. We said earlier on that Ezekiel had a huge responsibility as a watchman. 
But if you are a hearer of the gospel, and you are because it is being proclaimed to you here and now, it is proclaimed to you Sunday by Sunday. You hear it at home if you're in a Christian home. You hear it every time you read the scriptures or they are read to you. It says that you are accountable. You have a responsibility. If you heed these things, you will live. But if you don't, oh, the cost, the cost that will be yours, the pain that will be yours, the sorrow that will be yours is unspeakable. You are accountable for what you hear to God. You're accountable to Him. Why then will you die? Why go on in your sin? It's the most foolish thing that you could ever do. Because you're signing your own death warrant. I say to you then, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of his mercy, repent of your unbelief, repent of your ignorance. Repent of your pride. Repent of your stubbornness and refusal to come to Christ. If you do not die, you will die. I say to you again in the name of Jesus Christ, repent of your unthankfulness. Repent of your disobedience to your parents. Repent of your envy and your hatred and sometimes the bitterness that expresses itself in your heart. If you repent, living you will live. Repent of your adulteries and immoralities. Repent of your covetousness, your cheating, your lying. Look to Jesus Christ and live. Just like those who were struck by that plague in the day of Moses. And he lifted up the brazen serpent and those who looked they lived. I lift up Christ crucified to you. You look to him, you live. I say to you finally that Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, full of power. He is able. He is willing. Doubt no more. Look to him and live. Amen.